All right, everyone, welcome back to our last lecture of respiratory. Um, I will say this is the second time that I've recorded this video. The first time did the whole thing and something was wrong. The video did not have any sound and it was kind of skipping as it played. So rather than completely re-record this, uh, what I'm going to do is actually insert some content from a lecture from last year. So the slides may look a little bit different, but they will still be covering the exact same content. But as always, let's start with our not really attendance questions. First, how is most CO2 carried in the blood? Next, what are the products of CO2 and water? Next, as H plus increases, pH blank. And which cells produce cerebrospinal fluid, CSF? So go ahead and try to answer those. <coughs> Hopefully you've done that, so let's see what the correct answer is. First, how is most CO2 carried in the blood? Well, remember from our previous lecture, as CO2 comes in, uh, it goes several different paths, but two of those paths result in the bicarbonate ion. One of them goes through the erythrocyte, and then one of them goes into the plasma, but regardless of which of those two paths, it meets with water, which is tying into our next question. When it meets with water, it forms carbonic acid, and then that carbonic acid dissociates into H plus and the bicarbonate ion. The bicarbonate ion in the erythrocyte then moves out into the plasma. So most CO2 is carried in the plasma as the bicarbonate ion. Two different pathways lead to that. And as we just said, the products of CO2 and water are H plus and the bicarbonate ion. Sort of related to that, as H plus increases, what happens to pH? Well, the higher the H plus concentration, the lower the pH, more acidic. And finally, which cells produce cerebrospinal fluid, CSF? Remember, this was uh, in some of the ventricles of the brain and one other part of the brain. We learned this back in Bio 137. And the cells that produce the CSF are called ependymal cells or ependymal cells, which are a part of something called the choroid plexus. So all of that is going to come up today, and the next several minutes are going to be from a previous lecture uh, that was recorded last year, maybe even a little earlier than that. So don't worry if it looks a little different, it is still going to cover the same stuff. Now, just like we saw with the uh, medulla oblongata and the uh, cardiovascular centers that were there. We saw, you know, the uh, cardioacceleratory, cardioinhibitory, and also the vasomotor centers. The medulla oblongata, remember, is a part of your brain that keeps you going without you really having to think about it. It controls a lot of those things that keep you alive without your conscious input. And just like those centers that we've already talked about, there are some respiratory centers in your medulla oblongata. And these are the DRG and the VRG. Now, this picture is on page 860 of your textbook. And right down here is the medulla oblongata. And this is where we find the DRG and the VRG. Now, the VRG, or the ventral respiratory group, is just in front of the DRG, the dorsal respiratory group. The VRG, the ventral respiratory group, is responsible for setting your respiratory rhythm. 
it sets your respiration rate. And it does that by initiating inspiration and initiating expiration. And it does this kind of automatically. You remember how when we were looking at the SA node of the heart, that it completely depolarized on its own at a regular rate without any input? Well, the VRG does the same thing. It spontaneously depolarizes at a regular rate without any input. So it causes you to inhale and it causes you to exhale. But right behind that, there is the dorsal respiratory group, the DRG. And the dorsal respiratory group modifies the rate set by the VRG, the ventral respiratory group. The dorsal respiratory group modifies the rate set by the ventral respiratory group. Essentially, it tells it to speed up, to depolarize more quickly. Or it tells it to slow down, to depolarize more slowly. Remember how when we were talking about the SA node, it could be sped up or slowed down? The VRG can also be sped up or slowed down, and it's done by the DRG. So I like to tell my students, think about the VRG, the ventral respiratory group, as the autopilot. The DRG, the dorsal respiratory group, is kind of like the backseat driver. Speed up, you're not going fast enough, or slow down, you're going too fast. That's what the DRG does. But just above the medulla oblongata is the pons. And the pons also has a respiratory center called the pontine respiratory group, the PRG. And the pontine respiratory group has a few jobs. First, it smooths the transition between an inhale and an exhale. Most of the time, we don't pay attention to our breathing. And if we do pay attention to our breathing, it's really hard not to influence how we're breathing. But if you can just let yourself breathe and pay attention, when you inhale, you don't breathe in and then have this pause and then you breathe out. No, you're breathing in and then you're suddenly you're breathing out. It doesn't go breathe in, pause, breathe out. No, it's you're breathing in and then you're breathing out. It's a very smooth transition. And the pontine respiratory group is responsible for that. But also, the pontine respiratory group times your breathing based on certain activities. So, if you're giving a speech, you don't stop in the middle of a word to take a breath. No, you almost without thinking about it, take a breath at the end of the sentence when there's a natural pause there. When you're singing, you're breathing in very specific spots. Things like that are under the control of the pontine respiratory group. So the PRG can still give input to the VRG. And, in a manner of speaking, it also gives input to the DRG. Now, we've already seen this slide, but I did say that I was going to come back to it and explain it a little bit more. And again, you do not need to know this graph. I just want to explain what it means because up to this point, when we've talked about hemoglobin and saturation, I think a lot of students get an idea in their head that isn't really correct. So I want to show you what this graph means. This red line is called the oxygen or hemoglobin dissociation curve. And like we saw last time, what it shows us across the bottom is partial pressure. And then the higher up we go, that shows us the saturation of hemoglobin. And remember, saturation always means how much oxygen is attached to that hemoglobin. So in the lungs, 
the partial pressure of oxygen is 100 mmHg. And if we go up until we get to that red line, now this is going to show us what's the saturation of hemoglobin at that location. Trace it over, 100. So that means that the hemoglobin is 100% saturated. There are still four oxygens attached to that hemoglobin. Now, here's where I say that some students kind of get the wrong idea about something that happens. Let's go and find at the tissues. So once we've dropped off that oxygen at the tissues, ask yourself, how much oxygen is attached to the hemoglobin at that point, once we've dropped off the oxygen? Well, what's the partial pressure of oxygen at the tissues? It's 40. So let's go over here to 40 and trace it up until we find that red line right here. It's about 75. It's a little less than 80. So, you know, 75, 78, something like that. Well, what does that mean? If hemoglobin is 75% saturated, what does that mean? It means that there are still three oxygens attached to that hemoglobin. When we get to the tissues and drop the oxygen off from the hemoglobin, we don't completely drop off every bit of oxygen. As a matter of fact, most hemoglobin only drops off one of its four oxygens at the tissues. Now, when the tissues are very metabolically active, we will drop off more oxygen. But this is just at rest under normal circumstances. We only drop off one oxygen from each hemoglobin at the tissues. The other three remain attached. And I think a lot of students don't realize that when we're talking about oxygen unloading. All right, now let's start talking about factors that influence uh, our breathing rate. And this is going to require us to think back to something that we talked about in the previous lecture. Remember the CO2, carbon dioxide, pathway that leads to bicarbonate produces H+. It produces a proton, a hydrogen ion. So I'm going to pull up the whiteboard again, and let's look at that pathway. All right, I'm not going to draw that entire drawing again. I'm just going to draw that pathway that we just talked about. Remember, CO2 meets with water. Now, if the carbonic anhydrase enzyme is there, this happens really, really quickly. But remember, it's not needed because this also happens out in the plasma. So we're just looking at the reaction itself. So CO2 plus H2O leads to H2CO3, carbonic acid. And carbonic acid dissociates into H plus and something with a negative charge. In this case, it produces the bicarbonate ion, HCO3 minus. All right, hopefully that looks familiar. Now, what we just said was. This pathway produces an H+. It produces a bicarbonate also, but for every CO2 that goes through here, we get an H+. Let me write this a little bit more streamlined. CO2 plus H2O leads to H2CO3 leads to H+. Yes, there is also the bicarbonate ion. I just didn't draw it here. We're just looking at the fact that we produce an H+. So I'm going to streamline this a little bit more. CO2 leads to H+. Now that's not saying all of this other stuff doesn't happen. What this is doing is condensing it down and saying, for every carbon dioxide that we start with, we produce an H+. Before we go any further, make sure that you understand why I've drawn this this way. 
every CO2 goes through this that every CO2 that goes through this pathway produces an H+. Plus. So for every CO2 that does that, we get an H+. Plus. Now if that's true, if there's more CO2, what does that mean? We would get more H+. Plus. Or if there was less CO2, we would get less H+. Plus. But let's look at this part over here on the right. What's another way to say increased H+, plus? well, decreased pH. As CO2 goes up, pH goes down. Or when CO2 goes down, pH goes up. And that's going to be a really, really important factor. As CO2 goes up, pH goes down. Or when CO2 goes down, pH goes up. Now, that is always the case. Whatever CO2 does, pH does the opposite. That's always the case. Now, I'm going to write something in red over here, and I ask you not to write it down because I don't want you to think that I'm writing something that is true. Okay, so we can say beyond a doubt, whatever CO2 does, pH does the opposite. But we cannot say that whatever pH does, it means, I'm going to erase that H. We cannot say that whatever pH does, it was because CO2 did something. Lots of things can influence pH. If there was a drop in, in pH, maybe it was because CO2 went up. But maybe it was because lactic acid built up. Maybe it was because the person was diabetic and has ketoacidosis. Maybe it was from any number of reasons. Just because there was a drop in pH, that does not mean anything at all about CO2. Please keep that in mind. Whatever CO2 does, pH does the opposite. But just because something happened to pH does not mean that CO2 is the cause. So if I told you someone had a drop in pH, and that's all that I told you, you don't know anything at all about their CO2 levels. Now, I've said this several times, and I've said it several different ways on this since I started drawing in red. And that's because it is very important, and it's probably going to somehow tie into an exam question at some point. Yes, we can say whatever CO2 hap does, pH does the opposite. But no, we cannot say whatever pH is we can determine something about, P, uh, about CO2, because we can't. All that low pH tells us is that this person has a low pH. It does not tell us anything at all about their CO2 levels. So just for a moment, let's go back to our slide here, and then we're going to go back to the whiteboard. So as CO2 increases, there is a drop in pH. Do not switch those pH comes second. Now, that's important. Let's talk about what happens when someone's breathing shallow or slowly versus when someone's breathing rapid or deep. Shallow or slow breathing is going to have one effect. Rapid or deep breathing is going to have another effect. So let's go and look to see what happens. When someone is breathing, with every single breath, they breathe out carbon dioxide. Now, if someone is breathing slower, than normal, or if they are breathing 
shallower than normal? Are they breathing more or less? They are breathing less. So now put those two things together. With every breath, we breathe out CO2. If someone is breathing shallowly or slowly, they are breathing less. So what happens to the CO2 in their body? There's an increase in CO2. Their pCO2 goes up. If someone is breathing less because they're breathing either shallow or slow, they're not breathing out CO2 as much as they were. So, as their CO2 builds up in their body, we also have H plus build up in their body. Because remember, CO2, when it enters either the plasma or the blood, the red blood cells, it's going to go through that reaction. If there's more CO2, then it's going to go through those reactions more. Now, that CO2 that was in the plasma that met with water and went through that reaction, every single one of them produced an H+. So if we're breathing slower, if we're breathing shallower, CO2 is building up, and we're making more H+, in the plasma. And what's another way to say that? The pH of that plasma drops. If we breathe slowly or shallower, there's more CO2 that's going to build up in our body. And that CO2 that's in our plasma is going to meet with water and produce H+. And that's going to cause the pH of our plasma to drop. Now let's look at the opposite. If you are either breathing too quickly or you are breathing deeper than normal, are you breathing more or less than normal? You're breathing more. And if we blow off CO2 with every breath, what happens to the CO2 in our body? Our CO2 will go down, so we will have a lower pCO2. And if we have lower pCO2, there's going to be lower H+. And another way to say that is there is a rise in pH. So up at the top, this is shallow or slow breathing. Down at the bottom is rapid or deep breathing. Now watch this as many times as you need to. Keep rewinding it if you need to, to get this part to make sense. The less we breathe, the more CO2 stays in our body. The more we breathe, the more CO2 leaves our body. And whatever the CO2 does, the pH does the opposite. Now, those are the two ways that we can breathe. We can breathe fast or we can breathe slow. We can breathe deep or we can breathe shallow. But I want you to think about something. Everything that I've said here is important. But something else that I have not said might be even more important. And I love to teach this class in person because of the looks or the comments that I get when I say this. In all of this talk about when we breathe, what does it do, and all this that we've got written here, where did I talk about oxygen? I didn't. And that's because, despite what you've learned since kindergarten, we do not breathe to get oxygen. We breathe to adjust our CO2 and our pH.
let that sink in and I'll say it again. We do not breathe to get oxygen. We breathe to adjust our CO2 and our pH. When either our CO2 levels are too high or too low, or when our pH levels are too high or too low, that is what determines if we need to speed up or slow down our breathing. And based on whether we speed up or slow down our breathing, now we can see how does that breathing affect our CO2? How does that breathing affect our pH? So we're going to come back to this again in just a moment. We've seen how breathing can adjust our CO2 and how breathing can adjust our pH. But let's look to see why we breathe at the rate that we breathe. We know the underlying principles, but let's look to see the actual mechanisms. Well, there are chemical factors that adjust our breathing. So if we are trying to monitor those chemicals, the CO2, the pH, and yes, oxygen will play a role under certain circumstances, there, ne there must be a way that our body can detect the levels of the CO2 and the pH and the oxygen. And we've kind of already talked about them a little bit. We'll see in just a moment where that was. But CO2 is by far the most important chemical factor that, a, that, that influences our breathing depth and rate. CO2 is the most important factor that influences our breathing depth and rate. Next, pH. pH is also another very, very important factor that influences our breathing depth and rate. As a matter of fact, some textbooks put pH above CO2. Really, CO2 is more important, but as we've already seen, when we adjust CO2, that adjusts pH. So they kind of go hand in hand. But there's a term here, hypercapnia. Hypercapnia just means elevated CO2. Hyper means excess or more or above. Capnia is blood CO2 levels. Hypocapnia is just the opposite. That's when we have low CO2 levels. So both hypercapnia and hypocapnia are going to be important factors for our breathing rate. Now down here I have less important, oxygen. Now oxygen, most of the time, does not play any role at all in our breathing. But what it does do is it actually sensitizes some of the receptors we will talk about in a little bit to CO2. Don't worry about if that makes sense yet because we're going to come back to it. Oxygen, for the most part, plays no role in our breathing. So let's talk about those nerve endings, those special receptors that detect CO2 or pH or oxygen. And the most important of those receptors are in the brain stem. They're actually in the front portion of the medulla, and they are called the central chemoreceptors. And the central chemoreceptors are in the brain stem, the medulla. They are sensitive to pH. And really what they're sampling is that cerebrospinal fluid. So, let's go back to our whiteboard and look to see how they work. All right, this squiggly line represents the blood-brain barrier. Remember from Bio 137, the central nervous system, the brain and spine, 
are separated from the blood by this specialized, highly specialized membrane with a lot of connective tissue called the blood-brain barrier. And most things are unable to cross the blood-brain barrier. Now, depending on how much you talked about this blood-brain barrier, you may have talked about what can versus can't cross, but I want to talk about it here just in case. Things that are really, really small and things that do not have a charge can cross the blood-brain barrier. Things that are really, really small and things that do not have a charge. Things that are big and things with charge cannot cross the blood-brain barrier. Now, that's a protective mechanism. It keeps dangerous things that might be in our blood from getting into our brain. But at the same time, that kind of prevents things like our immune system. Those cells cannot even cross the blood-brain barrier. That's why it's really hard when we get some sort of brain uh, disease for our immune system to fight it off. Also, it's really hard for most drugs to pass the blood-brain barrier. So, a lot of medicines, it's really difficult for them to target the brain. But, let's look to see what's on each side of this blood-brain barrier. Over here, we're going to look at the blood. And, in the blood, there's all of that stuff that we've talked about so far this semester. But, we are concerned with the H+. Because remember, that's what the central chemoreceptors are sensitive to. So I'm going to draw a little weird nerve ending and just say this is a central chemoreceptor. And the central chemoreceptor is going to detect pH. It's going to detect levels of H+. Now, if there is too much H+, or if there is too little H+, then these central chemoreceptors are going to send a signal to the brain, specifically to the dorsal respiratory group. And the dorsal respiratory group is going to tell the ventral respiratory group to either speed up or slow down breathing. So let's see how that works. Well, on the other side, on the brain and spine slide of the blood-brain barrier, we've got cerebrospinal fluid, the CSF. And the central chemoreceptors are sampling the CSF for its pH. Now, let's look at what happens when there is a buildup of H plus in the blood for any number of reasons. Well, when there's a buildup of H+, we're kind of out of luck. Or, if there was a drop in H+, we're kind of out of luck. Does anyone see the problem here? The central chemoreceptors detect H+. H+, rising or H+, falling over here, well, it's in the blood. It needs to get to those central chemoreceptors. But it can't. You know why? Because of that right there. That positive charge. Remember, things with a charge cannot cross the blood-brain barrier. So central chemoreceptors are absolutely useless for detecting the pH of the blood. I'm just going to put an X through that. We will have a mechanism to detect that that we'll see later. But let's look at something else. What if there was a rise in CO2 in the blood? Or a drop in CO2? Either way. Well, CO2 can cross the blood-brain barrier. It's really small, and it does not have a charge. So CO2 crosses the blood-brain barrier. But we're still kind of at a loss here. Central chemoreceptors they're not sensitive to CO2. So what good is that? Well, the CSF 
It's a fluid. If you had to take a guess based on everything we've talked about this semester, what's the main ingredient of cerebrospinal fluid? Water. And what happens when CO2 and water come together? They're going to make H2CO3. But it gets even better. Who did we say at the top of this class makes cerebrospinal fluid? The ependymal cells. Now, the ependymal cells, when they're making cerebrospinal fluid, they add an extra ingredient. They're going to add an enzyme to this cerebrospinal fluid. Ependymal cells make an enzyme and place it into the cerebrospinal fluid when they're making it. Guess what that enzyme is? Carbonic anhydrase. The same enzyme that was in the erythrocytes. And it causes this to happen really, really fast. So not only is the CO2 in the blood able to cross the blood-brain barrier, it really, really quickly is converted to carbonic acid, which dissociates into bicarb and H+. And if there was more CO2, then there's more H+. Or if there was less CO2, then there will be less H+. But regardless, that H plus level is detected by the central chemoreceptors. Now, if the central chemoreceptors detect a rise in H plus, then they're going to tell the DRG, hey, our pH has dropped. And the DRG is going to tell the ventral respiratory group, hey, our pH has dropped. We need to fix it. And the VRG is going to respond by breathing faster. When we breathe faster, what happens? Well, with every breath, we breathe off CO2. So if we're breathing faster, we're breathing off more CO2. And when we breathe off more CO2, what happens? That rise in CO2 goes back down to normal. Let's look at what happens during hyperventilation. During hyperventilation, this CO2 would be down. There would be very low CO2 because you've breathed it all out. You, every breath you take, you're breathing off CO2. Hyperventilation, you're breathing more. So if you breathe too much CO2 off, then there's going to be less CO2 that crosses the blood-brain barrier. The H plus is going to be very low. And that very low H plus is going to try to tell the central chemoreceptors, hey, our pH is up, we need to do something about it. Now sometimes there's kind of a glitch, and someone who's having a hyperventilation attack can't slow their breathing. So what do you do? What do you do when someone's hyperventilating? You give them a paper bag, and they breathe in that paper bag. And every time they breathe out, they breathe it right back in. They breathe out, they breathe it right back in. What are they breathing back in? That CO2. So they've blown off so much CO2, but now they're breathing it back in, bringing the CO2 back up. That's why they breathe in a paper bag. Now there's another set of chemoreceptors called the peripheral chemoreceptors. And this is what I said we've kind of talked about already. This is a very similar diagram to what we saw on the first day that we talked about blood vessels. And the central chemoreceptors, they were in the brainstem at the medulla. But the peripheral chemoreceptors are in the exact same spot as the baroreceptors that we talked about. They're up here at the carotid sinuses in the carotid bodies. And they're in the arch of the aorta in the aortic bodies. And these, they're not sampling the cerebrospinal fluid. These are sampling the blood directly. The peripheral chemoreceptors directly sample the blood. They are also sensitive to more things. The peripheral chemoreceptors are sensitive directly to CO2 levels dissolved in the plasma. 
they are sensitive to pH from any source at all, and they are somewhat sensitive to O2. Now, as a general rule, like I said, oxygen plays a very minor role. Oxygen sensitizes these receptors to carbon dioxide. Really, what that means is we need oxygen for these receptors to detect CO2 in most instances. So, let's look at what happens when instead of either breathing slowly or breathing quickly, let's look at something else that these receptors are good for. Let's look at what happens when, whoops, when you have gone running. Let's say it's a really long run. And it's a really long run. What's going to start to build up? We're going to have a buildup of lactic acid. Remember, we've worked our muscles a lot. And when we work our muscles a lot and we use up oxygen, lactic acid builds up. So this lactic acid causes a drop in pH. Now, this has nothing to do with CO2. Remember, pH can be influenced by many things. Here, CO2 is not playing a role at all in this drop in pH. Here, it is lactic acid causing the drop in pH. And this low pH is going to be detected by the peripheral chemoreceptors. Why not the central chemoreceptors? Because this lactic acid is going to produce H+. That cannot cross the blood-brain barrier. The peripheral chemoreceptors can detect pH in the blood from any source because they're sampling the blood. So the peripheral chemoreceptors detect that low pH, and they're going to send signals to the DRG. The DRG gets that information and says, oh, there's low pH? I'd better tell the VRG. And the VRG says, low pH. What can I do about that? Hmm. Well, I can't do anything about that buildup of lactic acid, but I can do something about the pH. I'm going to increase the respiratory rate. And what happens when you increase the respiratory rate? You're going to breathe faster, and with every breath, we're going to blow off CO2. So if we're breathing faster because of an increased respiratory rate, our CO2 is going to what? We're going to have a drop in our PCO2 levels. Now, when there's a drop in PCO2, what happens to H? It's going to go down. And when pH, I mean, when H plus goes down, what happens? pH comes back up to normal. This is how the peripheral chemoreceptors work. So let's go back and look at something really important. Over here, the pH dropped, but it had absolutely nothing to do with CO2 levels. CO2 was not the problem, but CO2 was the fix. We can breathe to adjust CO2, and by adjusting CO2, we adjust the pH. Remember way back in the beginning, I talked about the lungs and how the lungs, one of their jobs was to adjust blood pH. When I was talking about how blood plays a, a big role in every chapter, I said when we get to respiratory, we're going to see how blood pH is adjusted by the lungs. This is how it happens. When you have a pH problem, your lungs can fix it. The reason you breathe faster or slower at different points is because you're adjusting your CO2 and you're adjusting your pH.
Now, everything up to this point, we've talked about how we breathe to adjust CO2, we breathe to adjust pH, and how oxygen plays practically no role. But under certain conditions, not only does oxygen play a role, oxygen can become the primary stimulus for breathing. But those circumstances are rare. This is when oxygen drops below 60 mmHg in arterial blood. What should oxygen levels be in arterial blood? Should be about 100, about 95 to 100. Well, this is almost half of what it should be. So let's look to see why this can be an issue and what you should not do when this happens. This can happen just if you're, you know, up in high altitude. We're not talking about that kind of hypoxic drive. Let's look at a patient who has COPD. In a patient with COPD, the C stands for chronic. So this is something that goes on for a really long time. Now, in COPD, the patient has a really difficult time breathing and it lasts for a really long time. And if something is making it harder to breathe, what's going to happen? CO2 levels are going to be really high. And your pH is going to be really, really low. And they're going to stay at those levels for a really long time because the patient can't breathe. And it's really common for someone with COPD, emphysema, bronchitis, things like that, to lead to a situation where those receptors are no longer sensitive to CO2 or pH. If the CO2 levels are high and the pH is low for long enough, those receptors become numb to them. And in that case, oxygen, which also is really, really low because we're unable to breathe very well, oxygen takes over and becomes the primary stimulus for breathing. But only when it's less than 60 mmHg. When oxygen is less than 60 mmHg, it can stimulate the peripheral chemoreceptors to tell you to breathe. But if someone is having this much trouble breathing, what do you do? You give them oxygen. But here's where it can become a bad problem. If you give them oxygen and you raise their blood oxygen back up to normal, back up to 95 to 100, all you've done is you've taken away that stimulus for them to breathe. The brainstem and the uh, peripheral chemoreceptors have become numb to CO2 and pH. They're no longer stimulating uh, us to breathe. And if you give too much oxygen and raise it above 60 mmHg in arterial blood, now we have no stimulus to breathe. And someone can suffocate to death with a face full of oxygen mask. So what do you do? You still give them oxygen, but you have to cut that oxygen and you have to make sure that their oxygen levels in arterial blood stay below 60 mmHg so that they still have a stimulus to breathe. But there are other controls for breathing. We've just talked about the main ones. These are other things that can influence our breathing. We can have, have a hypothalamic control. So our hypothalamus can stimulate us to breathe. Our hypothalamus is, uh, it plays a role in a lot of different things, but it's also tied into something called our limbic system, which is our emotional response. And here, pain and cold both affect the limbic system and can influence our breathing. For example, when you are in pain, we have that kind of gasping breath. Or when we are really cold, if we were to fall into cold water, we have that gasping breath. So the limbic system is under hypothalamic control of breathing. Cortical controls. So we can voluntarily breathe. Right now you can say, uh, okay, I'm going to inhale, and you can make yourself inhale. 
You can breathe faster or slower at will. So we can have cortical controls over our breathing. Proprioceptors. Proprioceptors are specialized nerve endings around our joints, around some of our muscles and tendons. And what they detect is the position of our body in space. The way that we know what position our body is in, even if we were to be in a completely blacked out room, you know what position your body is in. And that's because of your proprioceptors. But proprioceptors, in addition to knowing what position your body is in, they know when your body is moving. So when you are moving more than you normally would be, such as when you're exercising, your proprioceptors send signals to your DRG, which then sends signals to your VRG to breathe faster. We'll come back to this in just a moment. The irritant reflex. So the best example for this that I always give is if you are a non-smoker and you walk by a group of people smoking, even without thinking about it, you will often hold your breath or you may cough if some of that smoke gets into you. Or if you, even if you are a smoker, regardless if you're a smoker or non-smoker, if you walk into a store where they've been using a lot of harsh cleaning chemicals, you get that kind of sting and it automatically stops you from inhaling and it may trigger you to cough or sneeze. That's the irritant reflex. That is a reflex to prevent damage to your lungs. And the herring brewer reflex. We're going to demonstrate this in lab shortly. But the herring brewer reflex is another defensive reflex to prevent damage to your lungs. There are stretch receptors on the surface of your lungs. And when you inhale and your lungs expand, those stretch receptors detect that. And when your lungs are expanded, if you expand them fully and you try to inhale more, you can't. And that's because the herring brewer reflex. When your lungs are fully inflated, those stretch receptors send inhibitory signals to your ventral respiratory group. It prevents the VRG from sending any signals to cause more inhale. Sometimes, if it's stretched enough, it may even send a signal to cause your VRG to signal an exhale. And that's just to prevent overinflation of the lungs. And like I said, we will do that intentionally in lab coming up. Exercise and breathing. Anyone who has exercised knows that shortly after starting exercise, you start breathing faster. And it seems as though based on everything we've talked about now, the reason we're going to breathe faster is to bring that CO2 back down. Well, breathing faster does bring your CO2 down. But oddly enough, that's not the reason that we start breathing fast when we start exercising. Tests have shown we start breathing fast before there is a detectable change in CO2 or pH. So why do we start breathing fast? There's a few reasons. One, it's psychological. You know, you learn that, hey, every time I start exercising, I start breathing faster. And your brain learns that. It's learned behavior. So once you start exercising, you start breathing fast just out of habit. Next, cortical activation. So cortical activation, this is the activation of the part of your brain responsible for conscious thought and conscious movement. So when we start moving our skeletal muscles, when we start exercising and moving around more, that sends a signal to our respiratory centers. Activation of skeletal muscles also sends a signal to our respiratory centers. It basically says, hey, I'm moving more now, so I'm probably starting to exercise. Let's go ahead and start breathing faster. And lastly, proprioceptor input. Like I said earlier, those proprioceptors detect when we're moving. And when we start moving, signals are sent to our medulla. And it tells our DRG, hey, we're moving more. And our DRG tells our VRG, 
hey, we should probably start breathing faster. And all of those things happen before CO2 levels start to build up or pH starts to drop. They are all in anticipation of CO2 building up. We start breathing faster because we know that rise in CO2 is coming and your brain is wanting to get ahead of that rise. All right, so that brings us to the end of block four. We're gonna have our lecture exam coming up. It's going to focus primarily on digestive. So once you have gone through and studied everything, make sure to ask questions there is going to be some older material on the exam as always, but all that's left after this will be block five, where we will co uh, cover uh, urinary, which is, I like to say it is blood pressure part two, so make sure and refresh on blood pressure stuff. And then we will wrap up the semester with uh, pH maintenance in the body. All right, take care, and I will talk to you next time.